we reflected upon the traditions that we think of as the arts of the Islamic world, or what we think of as the Islamic world, not as a singular, monolithic, essentialized story that is, starts in one place and ends in another, but a set of places, um, expressions, artistic expressions, identities, histories, narratives that are layered and interconnected with each other in multiple ways. And when you walk through these gallery spaces, the idea would be that there's no right way or wrong way. It's about the natural, uh, organic way in which things have evolved, in which relationships and creative exchanges have, have uh, played out. And the result is that you can sit in, in Mughal India, as I am, and look into Safavid Iran, which is the next gallery from where so many important artists and artistic styles came right in this period. And you can walk from one set of um, objects to another and really e experience that with your own eyes. Uh, and then off another entrance here, you would walk from uh, the sort of Deccan coastline, arts that were produced from the Deccan coastline, all the way into Iberia. Uh, and you be, be able to sort of sense how the Islamic, Islamic networks brought India into conversation with places as far away as Spain. The practice of writing out the sacred words of the Quran in beautiful calligraphic styles is the most prestigious art form in the Islamic world. Uh, the prestige and its importance arises from the fact that for the Muslim, this is none other than the word of God himself. The earliest Qurans were of course written out on vellum, <clears throat> which is a form of animal skin, and um, were dyed different colors, or sometimes they were just plain. Um, and the Met has a page from one of the most distinguished early Qurans, which is attributed to 9th century North Africa, which is known as the Blue Quran. The Blue Quran that you see here on blue ground, which is dyed with indigo, and the letters are executed in gold. Um, this stunning composition, uh, visual composition, is uh, in part thought to have been inspired by Byzantine royal manuscripts, which were uh, often created on purple ground with gold letters. Uh, this one is executed in a style of calligraphy known as Kufic, which is one of the earliest styles, a square-based script, which is beautifully justified on the page in a perfect block through the extension and, and manipulation and composition of the letters so that you get this um, <clears throat> beautiful uh, justification way before you could just click it on a computer. You had to calculate it and great masters had to agree that this was the way the letters were to be extended or to be drawn out. And then their students had to do it in exactly the same way until it became uh, an established practice. Here we have one which was made in um, Spain and uh, it's in the style known as Maghribi or the Western style with these great looping forms. Uh, and here the, the, the paper has actually been dyed pink. It's the, it's the famous pink Quran. Uh, the Quranic tradition from the very beginning uh, till contemporary times uh, retains its prestigious position and is the quintessential art form of the Islamic world. An object like this is really a key to the visual world of the artist at the time. The works of art in this area are so interesting for the way in which they represent the continuities of late antiquity in the early Islamic period. Both the wooden items here on this wall have been attributed to about the 9th century. Um, this inlaid panel closer to me has been attributed to Egypt. Um, and you can see that it's been, it's been executed with a technique of inlaying tiny pieces of 
wood, different types of wood and different colors, and tiny pieces of bone to create an ornamental pattern on the side. Um, its function hasn't been completely determined. Some scholars feel that it was part of a cenotaph. Others have suggested that it was part of a large box that would originally have held multi-volume copies of the Quran and had a tremendous presence in the mosque. Um, but what's interesting, nevertheless, about its decoration is that it is so dependent in 9th century Egypt uh, on the traditions of the late antique period. For example, the central area here looks a lot like a Roman period floor mosaic. In fact, the little uh, inset, the circular disc in the, in the middle, shows grape leaves in a kind of Hellenistic style all over the, the center. You have arches here, sort of Roman arches, uh, with columns and capitals. And the capitals have these winged forms that evoke Sasanian designs. Um, and so it reminds us, uh, through its visual language, that, the, that early Islam uh, had this great success in that it conquered what was left of the Roman Empire in, in the West and the Sasanians in the East and absorbed those visual languages in its own new uh, styles. And therefore, you see this sort of great continuity here. One of the great treasures in the Islamic department is a chess set, which is probably the world's earliest complete chess set. Although it is missing one piece on the dark side, every other piece is, is extant, and it is a rare survivor from the medieval world of the game of chess. This game, um, as we know, evolved in early India, uh, and then in the Sasanian period, just before the dawn of Islam, in, moved to, was acquired uh, in Iran. And then once Islam came about, new networks were established and it became rapidly, the game became rapidly very popular at the Islamic courts and spread all over the Islamic world, including all the way to Spain. And when it reached the Western sort of frontier of Islam, it evolved further um, away from the direction that you see here into to closer to the chessboard that we've inherited today. Now, the main differences are as such. If you look at the pieces here, you see that there's a king, and next to him, a sort of throne-like piece, which is the king, and next to him is a smaller throne-like piece, which is the vizier, or the minister. That vizier later transformed into the queen, uh, the queen be and became the most powerful piece on the chessboard. We also have, um, to, the, to the other side of the king, a figure which has two protruding um, <clears throat> elements. And those are supposed to be the tusks of an elephant because these abstracted forms are actually uh, the shapes of, of elephants. And elephants were important part of the original game because it's a game of military strategy and the original Indian armies had an elephant brigade. So the feel, as they say in Arabic, is in fact an elephant, uh, very abstracted here, as you can see. That too transformed with contact uh, with Europe and no longer does it the westernized chessboard have a feel or an elephant, it has instead a bishop. So those two key positions were changed with, with this movement of chess. I'm sure it's easy for you to recognize the pawns uh, and other elements, but through the single um, movement of this game, we can sort of see how um, there was so much interconnection and, and exchange across this geography. One thing about the color, you can see that the two armies have been distinguished because one is glazed with blue and the other one is glazed brownish, and these are glazes on, on, on an earthenware body. In two pieces that we have on display from Spain show the introduction of ivory, African ivory, which leads to the white army and jet, jet black. Uh, the idea of jet black comes from the material jet, uh, which fashioned the second part of it. So um, that's why you get a black and white chessboard with a queen and a bishop, as opposed to a blue and brown chessboard with a king and a vizier and an elephant. As curators, one of the things that we get to do and we're meant to do is to bring objects together in relationship to each other so that they together tell a larger story than an individual object would. And this case really demonstrates how Chinese influence came to the art of the Middle East. 
And therefore, following the Mongol invasion in 1258, the, the rise of a new artistic style involved phoenixes, dragons, lotuses, and uh, peonies, and fish. We could start by looking at that great tile in the, big, in the middle, which is from a site called Takht e Soleiman, which is a, um, a royal site in Iran. If you look down here, you see that we've put together Chinese objects and Middle Eastern objects to show you that relationship. So for example, this little ewer is from the Ming period and it's got a dragon handle. And there up on the block is a uh, Iranian version, a Central Asian version, which, has, uh, which is made of metal but has the same shape and also has a handle made of dragon. Virtually identical, but a different medium and a different uh, uh, size. Here, for example, you have a bowl which is Chinese from the Song period, and you see fish in relief. And right back there, you have a medieval Iranian dish with a fish swimming around the center, also in relief, inspired by that sort of idea. I shouldn't ignore that wonderful dragon, who looks a little bit worm-like, worm because they hadn't quite mastered the ferocity and the full features of a Chinese dragon. But here he is in, uh, across, going across the exterior of, of a bowl. When, when we think about history writing, um, uh, the question of authorship always comes up. Um, who's telling the story? Who's in charge of the narrative? <clears throat> and what does history mean to different people at different moments? And when it comes to the Muslim world, or one of the great contributions, if you like, of, of Islam, or the court specifically of the Ilkhanids in, um, in medieval Iran, was that the arguably the first attempt at writing world history was born there. Uh, in the text that is assigned to the great vizier Rashid al-Din, the text which is known as the Jam al-Tawarikh, the history of the world. A later version of the same text is called the Majma al-Tawarikh, which further extends the idea of world history and different episodes. Um, and this was written in the 15th century. Now here we have two pages from the uh, Majma al-Tawarikh, which show you that this text was concerned with the birth of other religions. It was also, by the way, concerned with the birth of Islam. But in these two pages, we have uh, a story that tells you a story about Adam and one that's set in India. Um, here you see Adam, <clears throat> who is shown as a mendicant. He is in an open landscape, and the landscape is filled with these crops of rocks, the sort of uh, mushrooming purple and green and orange outcrops that you see are a kind of stylized Sino-Persianate rock formation. I say Sino-Persianate because a lot of these uh, landscape details find their origins in Chinese painting, which had come in as a great infusion into the Middle East in the Ilkhanid and, and in this medieval period. And here you have another illustration which shows um, a story from India or shows an idea about India that existed at the time and that is to do with the story of the Buddha and he's known as Shakyamuni as he's uh, as, as one of his uh, names and this is a story that open to interpretation it, it shows it discusses the Buddha as a prophet who is about to make another prophecy so you have a tree with a with a bird in it and you've got Indian figures clearly you can see the ethnic differentiation between these different types of figures and the idea that people were different and that people had their own unique traits. Even so, the basic approach to illustration of these his, this particular history text and several others of this type is basically to be straightforward about what you're doing without too much extra information in, in the pictures. It's a sort of simple, clean, very uh, demonstrative style. Uh, and it does provoke the question, why? What, what was it about the times, about the individual, about the, the, the traditions and the context that would um, create such an attempt? Uh, and, and one of the interpretations that has been offered is that because this is a Mongol period and the Mongols have come to establish themselves in the Middle East, 
uh, it is really the Mongols writing themselves into the history of the Middle East and the world. When, when we look at a painting uh, that was created in the late 16th century for the Emperor Akbar, um, we see that a whole sort of universe appears on a single page. And this, this world that we see was created by a number of factors coming together. Um, and the style that we see of the artist is something that we also um, have to consider when we, when we look and try to analyze works such as this. This one is attributed to the artist Mukund, who was one of the artists in the atelier at the time. Uh, he, has he has fallen back, as was common at the time, on many European models to execute this, this particular subject, which shows Alexander the Great shortly to undergo a mystical experience because he is in a bell jar, a transparent glass jar, which will be submerged under the water, where he will be visited by an angel, and this angel will transmit some important messages to him, including the foretelling of his death. The artist Mukund has fallen back on European uh, prints to create the background, which is a kind of misty, um, distant receding landscape, probably directly quoting a print, possibly a Flemish print. Uh, what's also interesting in the Mughal context is that uh, poetic texts were very beautifully illustrated and so were um, Hindu epics. Hindu epics were actually translated from Sanskrit to Persian and for the first time in some cases, such as in the case of the Ramayana and maybe the Harivamsa, were illustrated not for Hindu patrons but for Muslim patrons. One of the interesting things about being able to walk through these galleries and be and be able to look at a, a painting of a depiction from, from the Punjab hills of the Ramayana, not so far from a 16th century illustration to the Shahnameh from Tabriz, is that you can see the connections, the artistic connections between these different traditions that allows painters in the 18th century to fall back on a tremendous amount of, of development uh, and heritage that is their own, no matter whether they're illustrating the Ramayana or the Shahnameh, uh, the artistic language is one that's sort of developed uh, in relationship to each other. These three grand works around me are from a very famous series that was painted in the 18th century in um, Guler in the Punjab Hills. And they're known, it's known as the Siege of Lanka series because it's, from an, ep it's an episode from the Ramayana where uh, the heroes, Rama and Lakshman, are shown in different sort of... Um, parts of the narrative and the adventures that took place. Um, it's, it's a very special series for its size and for its artistic inspiration, um, but also in so many ways, it demonstrates how the painted, the, the painted traditions of Iran, of Mughal, the Mughal courts, and of the Punjab hills are somehow connected through the movement of styles, through the movement of motifs, and also through the movement of colors, which is something that I'd like to stress here. We actually start with an uncolored page, which shows the fallen heroes on the battlefield. And you can see them 
lying here on a bed of arrows, while the monkey and the bear armies um, and uh, all around them mourn them. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of expression shown in all of those um, uh, weeping monkeys and bears. But here's uh, another page, which is in a slightly more complete state in that it's been color blocked, but it's not been completely finished. It's still an unfinished page. Um, and in fact, for me, it's my favorite because of the fact that the narrative has just been really reduced to blocks of color through which the exciting episode is told. You have the golden city of Lanka, which is a, a, just a tremendous uh, splash of what's known as Indian yellow. <laughs> it's a very specific pigment that is produced only in India and in, in, in the context of Indian painting. You can see Ravana with his, his head, he's also sort of abstracted to just a kind of shadowy presence uh, with his multiple heads and multiple crowns. You see his um, evil demons, which are div figures that are modeled on, on almost Persianate div figures that you see in the Shahnameh of Shah Tamas. And you see the heroes here who are dressed in Mughal costume, but they also have, of course, um, other, other features and attributes. And all around them are the monkeys and the bears who've been, again, abstracted into just blocks of, of color. You see the monkeys are this block of taupe and the bears are a block of, um, uh, of, of a darker gray. Um, and so, and it's all set against this beautiful green ground, which is created through malachite, which has been sort of ground and mixed with other things to create this beautiful mogul green. We end where we started, which is trying to think about the idea of Islam, not as an essentialized monolith or a singularity, but a set of myriad expressions and exchanges that evolved over a long period of time, um, over a great geography, no doubt brought together by the religion of Islam, the faith of Islam, uh, as it spread and united people, but also involving the participation of non-Muslims, of non-Muslim cultures, um, and of traditions that existed before, around, uh, and outside Islam. And leaving a lot of space around all of these areas allows us to be able to look at the art in that way. Behind me, for example, is um, one of the most quintessentially Islamic um, features a prayer niche from the interior of a mosque. <clears throat> this one, uh, it's known as a mehrab, and this one comes from Isfahan, from a mosque uh, that was built in the 14th century. Um, and uh, this was part of, of a, a larger architectural space and was brought here to this part of the world many decades ago. Um, you can see that the calligraphy encompasses the Quran, it encompasses um, the Hadith, the sayings of the Prophet, and, uh, and it has a statement about the mosque being the home of all pious people right at the center. So uh, it, it is a very religiously, obviously quintessentially religious uh, work of art, but at the same time, it is so unique and specific to Isfahan and the styles that flourished in Isfahan. A mehrab in Bengal or mehrab in, in Cordoba would be entirely different. Um, so this diversity and unity uh, is, are the two horses we've been riding all through and the idea of continuity and change uh, evolved together as well.